John, can you tell us a time when you came close to quitting something or actually did quit something and where you were in that decision and if you went back to it or not and right. what played into it? Yeah, it's interesting. I've done that a couple times in my career and um, the thing, and it's funny, we just had a guest at CalArts. I, I uh, co-run the guest artist workshop at CalArts and we just had a guest who um, spoke about this exact same thing because he had a film that kind of got acclaim out of the out of the film festival, and he got you know uh, a big company interested in him. And he started a development deal, and he spent five years of his life in that in development hell, you know. But he was making money, and he had Hollywood interested in him, but nothing was happening. And similarly, I had, and so, and then he said, "Why am I doing this? I'm going to switch my career path, and I'm going to start doing this other thing, which became very successful." And so, I think it, it's important in all the arts, but especially in, in film, is to be very cognizant if you're doing something that is supposed to be achieving another end and you know you get caught up in it so that that becomes your life and you're not really achieving what you're trying to achieve so the, the, to give you a couple concrete an answers in in relationship to my career like um, very early on uh, well it's happened a lot like I came out of film school and I produced my wife's first feature and I very early on realized you know I'm very good at producing but I want to direct. So it was just like people came to me afterwards and said, oh, do you want to produce stuff, blah, blah, blah. I was like, no, I'll suffer, but I want to direct. So, and after, um, you know, I started doing music videos. I started with, I did the Nine Inch Nails Happiness and Slavery music video. So I got launched into this music video world and I did a bunch of music videos, like 20 to 30 music videos. And the music video world was kind of tightening at the time, like budgets were coming down and fewer and fewer things were being made. By the same token, they were still going out to multiple directors and having all these directors, like five to unfortunately ten directors at times, write treatments for these music videos. So you ended up writing all these scripts and I realized that after a year, like I've written two scripts worth of ideas for these music videos and I've maybe gotten five of them. But there's all this work that I've done and you end up on these hamster wheels in Hollywood where people get you to do work that isn't really, that always has the promise of something, but then doesn't really, but it's always dependent on someone else's decision. And so I was, it's funny, my editor at the time who was cutting my music video says, look, I know, you know, you guys all want to make features and, you know, and the only way I've seen it done successfully is when you guys jump off this hamster wheel and you just stop in cold turkey and stop doing music videos and write a script and get it made. And so that's what I actually did. I just stopped doing music videos and I wrote Cleopatra's Second Husband and got it made and you know that was my that was one of my first two features I made two I ended up at the simultaneously after I did that then the Better Living Through Circuitry documentary project came to me and I ended up making both of those simultaneously and then released those and then which leads me to my hamster, second hamster wheel story which is okay so I make these two features that get released you know theatrically not huge releases but they get you know a lot of film festivals and they get released theatrically and and um, so out of that I start you know it was a time in Hollywood this is like in 2010-11 when there were still spec scripts being bought by up-and-comers and so I actually sold two spec scripts right out of the gate my first two pitches I sold and which is you know decent money you know it was decent and um, so, but the problem is, is that as I was doing this, the spec market was also tightening. And so I kept on developing pitches and going out on pitches. It became a very similar hamster wheel to the music video world. And, um, and then I realized, well, this isn't going, and actually the last, this is what led me to bomb it because the, one of the last things I pitched on was a doc, it was a feature film about graffiti writers. And in order to, um, to, um, and I didn't know anything about graffiti at the time, and in order to have some sort of understanding of graffiti, I started doing interviews, you know, with friends, that friends set me up in, with in New York of graffiti writers, and I kind of got hooked on the actual documentation and what was going on, and less and less interested in the script, and then the script didn't happen, it was at Fox, and Fox ultimately said, oh, we don't want to have anything to do with graffiti like why are we making this film forget it and um, and then I just said fuck it I'm gonna make the documentary like kind of simultaneously and that was you know because at the time it was like I had spent you know I think I finished we finished the releases of Better Living Through Circuitry and Cleopatra's Second Husband around 2001 2000 uh, no 2011 no 2001 2002 and so I had been on this kind of spec hamster wheel for like a couple years by then so it was around 2004 and I just said it's time to make another film and it's just like and it's like 
you know, this world isn't working, and so fuck it, I'll do it myself. Like, which is basically most things that have kind of like if you if I look back on it, most things that have come to me in my life has have always been by me doing it myself, you know, or taking the initiative and trying to get and then bringing other people on board, you know, and not and of course it's not doing it myself totally. It's like the class is you know DIWO, which I don't like either, but you know it's basically you know. But it is kind of like your own initiative in saying, fuck it, I'm going to do it, you know, and that's where, you know, and that's even how I started my career is like in working in punk rock and, you know, and even the early distribution stuff I was doing with the punk rock um, videos that we made. It's like I saw, oh, well, no one's showing these, like, and these should be shown, you know, no one's showing these in Europe and like, you know, and so fuck it, I just got on the phone, you know, with a sat card and out of a phone booth at three in the morning and just started calling places and... You know, throughout my life, that's pretty much what, you know, it's, in, which is, you know, it's pretty obvious, like, from philosophically where I come from. And again, I think, to me, I'll just repeat, because I get called this DIY guy, which in a sense is true because of the attitude, but I don't feel that I do encourage filmmakers to not do it yourself. It's like, do it with others, but it's, I think, direct distribution is like a much more apt you know, title that you're going direct to your fans or direct to consumers as opposed to going through larger companies. And I do believe in hybrid distribution as well because I don't think that everything, the best way is everything is you directly. I think that other companies, if you can get certain other reputable companies involved in your releases, like I've done with New Video a couple times and, and CRM and other companies that Gravitas that I've worked with, that you can take advantage of their resources and they can help your release. All right, you get long answers to questions from me. So I think that's, does that answer your question? Okay, yeah. <laughs>